The Rams and Chargers looking toward the postseason, while the Dodgers and Angels focus on their managers. It's a big goodbye for LeBron, and the Clippers say hello to first place. All this and more coming up on Playing the Field. Don't go away. And thanks for joining us today on Playing the Field. I'm Maria Soreo. And I'm Will Lepardis. We're here at the beautiful Staples Center, of course. I feel like we are almost back into basketball mode after that very long World Series this year. Mm -hmm. And, of course, football's been exciting, so so much to get to in today's show. Big fall and winter now in L.A. sports. Yeah, it is, right? Except that outside, it's never really winter here, but, no. you know, we have to bring it inside to make it a little more. The weather outside is never frightful. It's not <laughs> But you're going to be going to Frightful Weather, yes? I hope to see some of it. It's all over the place yeah. now. But, um, yeah, going back to Oklahoma. Very nice. Where my Oklahoma Sooners have made the college football playoffs. So that's, that's all I exciting. really All I want under my tree is two more victories. <laughs> that's all you want to see. Yeah. That's all you care about. Mm -hmm. All right, and speaking of victories, uh, you know, the tr in football, in the NFL, mm. of course, our Rams and Chargers both doing very well, both really looking for playoff berths this year. And it looks like they're going now. The Rams, they, they had a big game the other night. They didn't do too well against the Chicago Bears. Nope. But you know what? I think if one of those games is going to happen, because we really see it every year, I think, one one game, you have a really bad game. I think that was their, just their really bad game. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, their losses have come to, like, the top, yes. the top teams. Yes. So maybe yes. they... Hopefully they have what it takes to get over those top teams, but they haven't yet. I hope so. I mean, the Saints, they did beat Kansas City, but they lost to the Saints. But now the Saints have been on a bit of a skid themselves. And mm -hmm. we had a very strange weekend last weekend, but the Chargers did win. Now, the Chargers are doing very well, but they're in the same division as Kansas City, who right. is lighting everybody on fire. Right. So Chargers kind of have to keep winning. They can't they be do. comfortable. But they, uh, they look to be... The AFC playoffs. That's right. If they just keep up what they're doing. They have to keep up what they're doing, you know. And I had a chance this past week to visit with the Chargers. One of my very favorite stories every year is the NFL initiative, My Cause, My Cleats. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the players get to put their very favorite charities or organizations that, that they support on their cleats. And as you're seeing right now on some of the, the shots that we took, very near and dear charities that are near and dear to the players' hearts. And it's it's heartwarming. It, it It's a feel-good story. But it really shows how much things outside of football mean to these players, you know? Yeah, it's always great when we see our pro athletes stepping in and on days off when they probably want to rest. Right, they don't. Go, go do something wonderful for other people. I love that. Absolutely. I do as well. So let's uh, catch up with some of the Chargers and find out what their favorite charities are and why. My charity, actually, well, this year I'm doing Sick of Cell and Awareness. Um, last year I did autism, um, so basically Sigur Cell is for uh, one of my good friends from high school that I grew up with. Um, he was diagnosed with Sigur Cell when he was young and stuff, and I just see him, you know, throughout all the years how he's been struggling with it, but also bouncing back and, you know, being getting better with it and all, so I just wanted to do something special for him this year. It's great because that's something that a lot of people don't know about, and you really can bring the awareness out having the platform that you do. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, and that's what you use it for. You use your, you use your opportunities, you know, to help out others. And and I feel like you know that's my helping hand. That's why I'm on this earth is to give back and to and and to use my platform for a better cause. You guys are so focused on football all the time. Do you feel like this kind of um, maybe brings things back down to earth sometimes when you focus on an initiative like this? Yeah, definitely. It keeps you humble all the time, especially when you think about those that that need it most. And I feel like you know that's. That's where uh, I think I'm more poised at is when I think about others and it keeps me uh, humble and, and everything like that. Now, did you design the cleat at all? Or? Uh, actually, my little brother designed it. Uh, yeah, he's, he's an artist. He's, he's in school for uh, media arts and animation. So this is what he do. He draw. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to give him the opportunity to do that as well. And how are you loving it? Uh, I'm liking it, actually. I'm trying to figure out which cleat I'm aware. <laughs> Uh, right now, I'm, I'm liking this shoe, so uh, they both good looking, but um, but uh, I feel like, you know, it's, a, it's an awesome cause. It's an awesome opportunity to go out there and, uh, you know, show my cleats to the world. Will you keep your cleats or auction them off or um, give them away? Well, so even though I got two cleats, so I'm going to wear one and I'm going to auction the other other one, but the ones that I'm going to wear is going to be the one I give to my uh, friend. You know, just to be able to raise awareness for diabetes, you know, it's something that's been going on within my family for a while. And, you know, it's very near and dear to my heart and my family's heart, so that's why I chose it. 
tell us um, about your cleats and did you design them or how did it work? So the, the, uh, I work with this dude, his name is um, Blake from Beach Street Shoes here in Orange County. Um, he made these awesome cleats for me. Um, shout out to him. These are wonderful. Um, can't wait to walk them. This is such an important initiative, and you know, regardless, to, you spend all of your time playing football and focusing on it. Do you feel like this kind of brings everyone back down to earth for a minute? Definitely. Um, you know, just it gives guys a sense of style. You know, to be out there and go out there and express how they feel about a certain, you know, um, a certain uh, foundation or charity or whatever it is they have going on. So it brings a level of com comedy down to people and it allows them to be them. Okay. And then now, what will you do with your cleats? Will you auction them off, keep them, give them away? I might donate them, you know, I haven't really decided yet. I'm going to talk more with my agent, my, you know, my parents, see what they want to do with them, but still thinking about it. My rookie year, my mother was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. Um, and a year later, she was um, uh, pronounced um, breast cancer free, you know, so, and my aunties and a couple other fe females in my family have been affected by breast cancer. And Susan G. Coma, um, my marketing team, reached out to them my rookie year. And ever since then, I've been doing stuff with them. So that's what I'm doing this year. Yeah. It's so inspiring because you have a personal story and your mom's doing great now, yes? Yes, ma'am. She's doing she's doing awesome. She actually be at the game. Um, she's healthy. She's up. She's still working. Um, vibrant as ever, and it's, it's a good thing. Do you feel like, because you guys get this opportunity once a year to do this, that it sort of brings everybody kind of back down to earth and what's really important? Yeah, no doubt about it. It just goes and shows that this is more than a game. We're all human. Um, we go through stuff. Our family goes through stuff. Um, it's not all glitz and glamour. But... Um, the stage that we have, we get to bring awareness to stuff, and if we can do this and bring awareness to things such as this, breast cancer will be mental health or whatever guys are represented in, um, in their foundations or just something that they feel strongly and believe in, um, I think that can change lives. Okay, so um, you have your shoes now. Will you keep your shoes, donate them, give them away? I'm going to actually donate them after this game. I'm going to actually donate them. I have a lot of cleats that I need to donate at the end of the year, but these specifically um, to a breast cancer survivor I'm going to actually donate to. Yeah. Is it somebody specific? Nobody specific. I'm going to do a little raffle draw. My marketing team's going to help me with that. But, yeah, these for sure are going to be, be donated. And, and who designed these? Um, Marcus Rivera. Souls by Air on Instagram from Miami, Florida. He does all my cleats. Um, he's a really good dude, good person, but his, his work is second to none. Scott, first tell us about your charity that will be on your cleats on Sunday. Uh, so I chose the Lymphoma and Leukemia Founda Research Foundation because my brother was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2014. So, uh, you know, he is still playing ball, but he doesn't get to do the My Cause, My Cleats this year. So I decided to do it in uh, honor of him. You know, it's interesting because this sort of gives you guys a platform where you can get information out about charities. And I just, do you feel like it kind of grounds all of you in a different way? Oh, uh, yeah, I think it's a really cool, uh, really cool thing. You know, people get to, you know, change the cleats they wear, which people like to do and, you know, help their foundations out and kind of just help create awareness for you know different foundations like guys on our team we got I know Sickle Cell and you know then Mike Pouncey's got his foundation and Russ ha Russell Okung has his so it's just a really good way to just get awareness out there for everything. Yeah. Now some people auction them off keep them give them away what will you do with yours? Uh, I'm gonna actually keep them and give them to my brother and uh, my family so you know it's a cool memento to have for my rookie season and uh, you know to be able to remind me of what this season was all about. You you you, you never realize that you know you can you can uh, you know brand something on your cleat and just bring more awareness to it. You know, I think it's a great thing that the NFL is doing, just another opportunity uh, for people to see, you know, that we are in a community. We, we do care about the youth and we do want this sport to continue uh, at a high level like it is, you know what I mean? Uh, so, like I said, it says a lot about the players in the NFL today, the NFL as a whole, and I think it's a great thing. Well, that's such a great event, such a good piece you put together, and you're also going to be with the Rams for My Cause, My Cleats, as well, in I the future. Yes, I absolutely will. In fact, they're going to be wearing them this weekend, so on the next show, we'll hear about um, all the Rams stories of My Cause, My Cleats, as well. And, of course, you know, Sean McVay is always very honest with us and tells us, you know, what goes wrong. He always blames himself when there's a loss or there's something that he says, you know, the play calls weren't good, they weren't mm. right. And so um, we always love to hear from Sean, so let's take a look. <laughs> What I, what I love about our team is, is how resilient they were to continue to fight after we put ourselves in a hole from self-inflicted wounds. And, and we got to be able to figure this out and figure it out fast because these last couple weeks, we're doing things that are totally uncharacteristic of what good football teams do, what we've done uh, through the first you know handful of games this season. Um, you know, but the only thing we know how to do is go back to work, look at ourselves. Everybody's got a hand in this, and, and we got to get it figured out fast.
You know, that, that's something that we've got to get figured out, got to get figured out in a hurry. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's guys that are making decisions that, you know, typically we haven't seen. It's guys that are making mistakes that we typically haven't seen. But uh, however you cut it, we're all in this together. We've all got to do better. And, um, you know, it starts with me, but, you know, we got to figure it out. And, you know, that's that, all I know how to do is go back to work, work as hard as we possibly can to figure out the solutions and, and get better for next week. But, but this wasn't good enough, and, um, you know, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow. There's some things where we're taking negative plays on early downs as a result of not executing. Uh, when you put yourself behind the sticks, when we take some of the penalties that we're taking, uh, it's tough to overcome those against a good defense, a good front like they have. And those are things that we just can't do. And we got to get it fixed and we got to figure it out. And, you know, like I've said, you know, I, I got to do better, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, you know, work as hard as I can to get this thing figured out. And I know everybody in that locker room feels the same way. How concerned are you about Todd Gurley's knee? Um, you know, based on just the information that I'm getting and just talking to Todd, I, I wouldn't say that I'm concerned. I think we want to be really smart about that. And the thing that's great about Todd is um, he's very decisive and he's a great communicator with regards to how he's feeling. And I think he understands his body better than anybody else. I don't get the sense that he's concerned, but he want, we want to be smart about this. And if it's feeling like something where he's not going to be able to be the Todd Gurley that we're accustomed to seeing just based on the way that that thing's feeling, the smart thing for him, number one, one and for our football team is to be able to rest him and, and get him back, um, you know, as quickly as possible whenever that is that our next game after the Niners will be. Do you um, expect that Todd will be available for the playoff game whenever that is, or is it going to be a week-to-week, day-to-day? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly, you know, I, w I would think so, Gary, but, you know, I, if you said a couple weeks ago that, that we would have to hold him out for the last two weeks, probably would have been surprised about that, but... Based on the information that we're getting, uh, there there isn't any reason for us to press the panic button or think that he won't be available. Uh, but it is important for us to get him back to, to full speed and to you know uh, the health that he feels like he can go compete at. And we're not doing anything to, to put him at risk, and and he's not doing anything for the longevity of his career. Well, Coach McVay always has a lot to say after a game. He's got a lot up there in that noggin of his about football, so he lets us know about it. You know, between him and Wade Phillips, I have to tell you, it is so much fun to go to practice and listen to them because they're football geniuses at this point. Come on. Yeah, he's got a football Jones, and he, he does. I think that's all he, that's he all he processes. Him. That's right. But that's good if you're in, in, your, in your head, Coach. Yes. Just eat, sleep football. He does. And talk. He does. He, I remember last year somebody asked him a question about pop culture, and he kind of looked at us like. I don't know what you're talking about, and, and it wasn't like in a rude way. He just, he's always thinking about football, so I like that in head coach. That's why a, 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 the whole NFL wants a, the next Sean McVay. They do. They, they want somebody who's only, you know, on the foot, football, football on the mind all the time. That's it, 24-7. All right, that's true. Now, I know the World Series just ended like five minutes ago, mm -hmm. but we have actual baseball news here in L.A., Will. Really? We do. We do. Well. Dave Roberts, he's re-signed now for four years, so... Great move by the front office because right. we love Dave. And the Angels, after 19 years of Mike Sosha, mm. had to hire a new manager. And he is in the Dodger family a little bit. He a few is. Years ago. Brad Osmus is now he is now the manager at the Angels. So that's kind of exciting. I like when I actually know the manager that's coming on. And, and it's such a long time with the same manager. Right. Obviously, he brought a World Series championship to Anaheim. And right. now a new era begins. It'll be interesting to see what moves he makes and yes. um, I mean, if, if he can cultivate that star power that's kind of been happening down in Anaheim. Well, it's true. And, you know, it's interesting because when you think about it, I mean, you know, I'm sure all of his coaches are going to change. A lot of things are going to change mm -hmm. having a new manager there. So it's, it's going to be fun to see. And, of course, I'm sure he's thrilled to be working with Mike Trout sure. and, you know, Albert. And it's just like he said, a whole new era in Anaheim, that's for sure. Yeah, he's got a nice roster to pick up and begin that era with. That's right. You know, and to touch upon Dave Roberts for a minute, you know, I, you want to talk about, we talk about Moneyball a lot, and I really want the fans to understand something. I, this is the new MLB. The, the new MLB means that it's about sabermetrics, it's about information, and it's about using your gut, but I don't think they've actually married those two together yet in an exact formula. It's not an exact science. I think you're right. It, yeah, it's not an exact science, but I think they feel it's as close as they can get to one. It and is with, close. And with money, you mentioned money ball, and, yes. it, and, and money being the key there. Right. They really want to use probability and odds and mathematics as close as, as they can because it has gotten them. The, the, 
uh, the Dodgers has gotten them to the World Series two years Twice, in a row. but it hasn't gotten them the W in the World Series yet. And I don't know if that's to if we can blame the math of the cybermetrics on on the World Series loss. But I think, yeah, you're, you, you are correct that the front office orchestrates the moves a yes. lot more than Coach Roberts does. Right. So I just want people to understand that having Dave Roberts for the four years is like a great thing. He's a great manager. Yeah. We love him. Players love him. Front office loves him. So please... Just understand that there's a whole bunch of moving parts when you're playing baseball, from playing the game to the front office, to the managers, to everybody else. And so mm -hmm. Dave is our guy. Congrats, Dave. You deserve the four years. And I, I love you. So I'm happy to see you back there. I agree. We're glad to have him back. Absolutely. So I feel better now that I've yeah. brought that out a little bit. Hopefully so. fans do know that because he is the face he, of all the decision making. He, right. But exactly. he's not the source of all the decision making That's is what you're trying to say. Very good point. Very good point. All right, well, we are here in Staples Center. This is a Clipper game tonight, and when we come back, it's going to be all about basketball, so don't go away. All right, well, Dwayne Wade is saying goodbye to basketball, and he's on the goodbye tour, and as you can see last night, he traded jerseys with LeBron James at the Laker game, and uh, you know they're very good friends. Well, even off the court, they've been friends mm. for a really long time, and that was kind of a cool moment to see that happen last night. Yeah, they seem to be the best of friends. They yep. played four years together on the same team. That's it. They were actually going into last night's game here at Staples, the Heat and the Lakers. Uh, they were 15 and 15 against each other. Oh, wow! So LeBron That's won. Amazing. LeBron won that 31st and deciding game. So he's got one game up competing against D Wade. And uh, yeah, they did the jersey swap, which Dwayne's been doing with a lot of um, other teams, opposing on the, teams. On the had, little tour. There's kind of guys he's mentored, guys that he's friends with. Um, I don't know if the Clippers had a jersey swap. Swap. I don't. I don't know if they know. they got to be a part of that, but the Lakers certainly did because they of because of, of LBJ. Mm -hmm. so it, it's it's interesting when you think about the fact that they've been that good of friends. It kind of makes me wonder when they're on each other out there on the court. They know each other so well. Mm -hmm. That's got it. Does that give one player an advantage over the other one, or not really? I, I, it probably ends up being pretty even because they even. they both know each other. Yeah, very but, well. But from what we all saw last night, um, they that it, it was about fun. I it don't, was. I, I think so. I, the competitive the competitiveness was there, but Wade and and James just they. Well, it wasn't about fun for Luke Walton. <laughs> I think no. he wants to win the game. No, and he, he got the win. <laughs> yeah, he did for, get the win. Fortunately, LeBron yes. made his free throws in the stretch. <laughs> yeah. And the Lakers got the W. Thank goodness for everybody here in L.A. Exactly. But, uh, yeah, they were having fun out there. And D. They Wade were. gave him a big big old hug down in the corner yeah, of the court. and that was fun. It didn't seem as competitive. But, yeah, it was but a it was little fun. competitive. I think it was a little competitive, though. <laughs> I think that LeBron always wants to win, that's for sure. Absolutely. Now, you know, we talk a lot about uh, the Lakers here in L.A., but the Clippers this season, mm -hmm. I have to tell you, we're about a quarter of the way through, mm -hmm. and this Clipper team is honestly the most together, exciting team I have seen play in a Clipper uniform in a very long time, if ever. That's absolutely true. And there are no stars on this team. <laughs> I, I, it depends what you want to call a star, but I mean, um, no, no major, no major. Right, I know what okay. you mean. We do, Tobias Harris, who um, I mean, I don't know if it's worth saying anymore, but he's he's what we got for Blake Griffin. Yes. So so Tobias Harris is an MVP candidate. Right. I mean that's of course now that's pretty. <laughs> I mean yeah, but he's 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 an assist maker. I mean he's yes. he's doing a lot of things. I don't know if, if the LA market really knew Tobias that well. He, he was so. a, he was a piston. But yeah, they're they're moving the ball. He's one of the great cogs. Obviously, Lou Williams comes off the bench. Mm -hmm. um, even uh, Shea Alexander, yes. Shea Gildas Alexander, he is an overperforming rookie. I mean, he right. came from Kentucky. Always smart so for fun these to G watch. these oh GMs know how to draft these Kentucky players they do. because they're really there's so many Kentucky guys now that that go to the pro game. You know, Duke's right. a great. Yes. I don't want to get off on college too much, but yeah, Alexander is is kind of a rookie of the year candidate. I don't. There's a guy in Dallas who's probably going to win it. Maybe. But 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 Shea is uh, very nice, and he's a big reason why this Clipper team's doing so well. It, true, and you know we had a chance to catch up with some of those guys, so let's take a look. Mm -hmm. Shea, what is working so well for this Clipper team right now? Um, uh, I think we're. I expected this from the team. Um, I think I just the rest of the the rest of the league is realizing how talented we are, um, 
and how good we are and how unselfish we are. Um, and when you have those two things, you'll be all right. I think we just logged into the game plan um, from start to finish. Um, and just try to make their, their obviously talented players as uncomfortable as possible, and make the rest of the other guys beat us. And I think we did a obviously good enough job to win. I just think we, we all work hard um, and we're all for each other. Um, and and when, you, when your ultimate goal is to win, each and every guy in the locker room, um, that's what's, the outcome happens more, more often than not. You know, things happen. You know, we didn't lose our composure going into overtime. We didn't panic. Uh, we ended up, you know, getting down by three in the overtime. Like I said, we kept our composure, kept fighting, and came out with a big-time win here at home. Such a different Clipper team this year. What, what does it feel like for you and from your perspective inside this locker room? Uh, a team. That's what it is. It's a team. You know, nobody's about self. Nobody's about, you know, this one person or nobody's, you know, in tune in the me, me, me. You know, it's a team effort. You know, there's no telling who's going to have that big night when we come in here. Uh, and we don't care. You know, the name of the game is win and, you know, move on to the next. And, you know, that's what feels like we're all in tune and doing in the soccer room, you know, playing it one game at a time. And whoever has a good night that night, they have it. And we just want to win. You know, that's what it's about. And now I'm playing the field. We are introducing a new segment called Leading in L.A. That's right. That's right. And in this segment, we talk to the men at the top. Dave Roberts, Sean McVay. Mm -hmm. We're looking to get somebody in basketball, maybe a, maybe a Doc Rivers. Nice. And, you know, really what's interesting is these guys are really the face of the team. Mm -hmm. they, they take the blame and not so much the glory, I don't think, because... Yes, they're at the top and they're the leaders, but I think the players take the glory when, when they win. Absolutely. And the coaches take it when they lose in, in the opposite way. So it's interesting how they sort of even it out and, you know, help the players to kind of do well on the court, on the field, in the game. We're talking that, about that guys, kind of a situation. guys who must have a very thick skin. Very thick skin. And, um, yeah, all the pressure is, is on them. Yes. L.A., second biggest market. Right. It's not easy to manage these kind of egos and these big teams. Exactly. So it's going to be a very cool thing to start seeing on our show. It, it is. And, you know, it's interesting because I remember Rex Ryan, when he was the coach of one of the NFL teams, he was a coach of, he says, you know, we're all hired to be fired. And it's mm -hmm. kind of true because when you're doing great, they love you. And when you're not, right. you're looking for another job. Rex Ryan, it's a throwback. It was a, yeah, it was I mean, kind of a throwback. It must have been a Jets, a, yeah, a Jets team, I think you mean. I was going to say that, yeah. And it wasn't sure, but I think it was, that was <laughs> probably the job. Wasn't a good look there. <laughs> but... One of the coaches in the NFL doing very well right here in L.A. is Coach Sean McVay. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting, you know, when he first came in, he was 30 years old. Everyone said, oh, he's a 30-year-old head coach in the NFL. By the end of the season, which was last year, takes the rounds to the playoffs, and everybody was saying, hmm, where can I get a Sean McVay? Yeah. So having said that, let's catch up with Sean McVay leading in L.A. It's interesting. When I started looking at you, Dave Roberts, and Luke Walton, there were so many kind of crossover similarities, kind of going with you and Dave, you come into the number two market in the country, yeah. an iconic franchise with you at the Rams. When you came in, did you think about all of that or was it was it just something that was sort of there but you didn't really put a lot of weight to it? You know, I think really you feel fortunate to work in a big market and, and you know, the bright lights and the city of LA, you're so excited about that. But really we're kind of just focused on doing the best that we can uh, you feel fortunate to work in the NFL and get a chance to, to do what you're doing, something that you love every single day with great people, great players. So, um, you know, I don't think you really kind of process it like that. But the thing about Dave, and, you know, I don't know Luke quite as well as I know Dave, is I think there's a consistency in terms of, you know, we're going to work as hard as we can to try to establish a culture, but most importantly help our players reach their highest potential. And do it in a positive way where – you always want the players coming in, uh, enjoying the atmosphere and the environment where there's a sense of urgency, but you also realize what a blessing it is to be able to do what we're doing. And I think you can get that done in a positive way, and um, that's the approach that we want to be able to take. For you, was it daunting to know the team was 4-12 and the year prior? You come in, you take the, the, the team to the playoffs. What stands out most to you, or was last year kind of a blur now looking back? You know, I think what it's what stands out the most, Maria, is the fact that you get a chance to really, you know, when you first start out, you know, you, you first of all, you get a chance to be around a great coaching staff. And I feel so fortunate where you don't have a lot of experience, but you get somebody like a Wade Phillips. You've already got somebody like John Fossil in place. You can get an assistant head coach in Joe Barry. 
an offensive line coach and Aaron Cromer, and then a lot of other assistants that have been so instrumental in being able to allow us to have a little bit of success so far. And that's what it's about, being with great people. And then when you get here, you can't imagine, you know, you, you really appreciate what great players we had. And then we were able to sign some free agents or acquire some players through trades mm -hmm. that really upgraded our roster, but also upgraded the leadership in the locker room. And when you look at guys like Andrew Whitworth and what they're able to provide from a leadership standpoint, John Sullivan, Roger Saffold being able to stay healthy, stay at the left guard position, what that does for the development of an Austin Blythe and a Rob Havenstein up front. You get Jared Goff continuing to feel comfortable. Todd Gurley, those two taking steps to be able to be great leaders. Uh, guys like Robert Woods, you draft players like a Cooper Cup. Uh, right. And then when you get over on defense, you know, you have guys that, you know, were already in place in an Aaron Donald. LaMarcus Joyner is a phenomenal safety. So I think it's been a combination of getting the right kinds of guys in the building over the last couple years, but then also having some really special young players that are continuing to develop uh, and really become special leaders as well. And, and, you know, that's what it's about, all about the people you're around. Sounds like they're making your job too easy, Sean. They are, you know, <laughs> they are. And really, you know, I think there's the one thing you appreciate more than anything, though, is that in a lot of instances, you know, it can be overwhelming yeah. uh, when you get so fortunate to get into a role, and especially when you just don't have the amount of experience that uh, a lot of guys do have when they get into it. You know, and I'm not afraid to admit that, but what you also feel really fortunate about is that you've got people that have more experience that you can lean on so that we can help try to figure out what are the best solutions and what are the best ways to handle different circumstances and situations for our team. And it might not be for everybody, but you know, we truly try to make sure that everybody's inclusive uh, and included in what we try to do and, and provide a why for our players. And I think that helps create the understanding and really we talk about the clarity from a communication standpoint. And when everybody's on the same page, uh, I think that can help us be able to sustain a certain level of success and, and going in the same direction. Prior to you getting here, the one thing that all the players said the year before was, we have to change the culture, which kind of seems like a big thing. Yeah. What did that mean to you? Because clearly it changed. Well, I think the biggest thing is, is, you know, what we look at as the culture, Maria, is really, you know, how we do things around here. And I think that's uh, something that's become what it is because of the ownership that our players have in it. You know, okay. we, we have a certain s set of circumstances, the values, the things that we deem important with how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but ultimately, the players having it come to life by their actions, the way that they consistently go about their business, is something that's really important and I think is what made, has, what has made this special up to this point. Okay. Um, and, and we try to do things, you know, and collaborate. And that's coaches and players alike. But it's, okay, what do we want to stand for? What are the core things that we believe from a football philosophy standpoint, from a standard and expectation standpoint with how we go about our day? And we believe that we can get those things done but still enjoy that process along the way. And I think the consistency and the standards that everybody's held to the certain set of circumstances and standards enables us to really you know, be consistent in that approach. And I think there's a respect factor where whether you're an Aaron Donald, a Todd Gurley, a Jared Goff, or whether you're a guy that uh, is on the practice squad, you know, the certain rules that we have, uh, nobody's above that. And, and, and I think they respect that. And, and we're not above being coached as coaches either. And I think that's important for our players to feel that 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 shared accountability, that shared coachability that everybody has creates an atmosphere that's conducive for growth and everybody working in the same direction. Well, that was a great piece on Sean. And next month, we will show you another leader another in LA. Another leader in LA, absolutely. And another really great story I had a chance to, to do is called uh, Wings for Life, which is a charitable organization. Very interesting, it helps spinal cord injury injuries, but what's neat about it is they do different sporting events and anybody can join in, participate, compete. And they had kind of a scavenger hunt, which was really interesting because it was many sports that they wow. were sort of doing all day long in different areas. So I met them at one of the events. And uh, always great to meet new people and mm -hmm. see what people are doing. Yeah, that was wonderful to see. It was fun. Another great cause you exposing for us. Listen, you know what? We have to get out there and get all the good stories, that's for sure. Hey, another great story is our very good friend, Andy Bernstein, mm. who of course is one of the best photographers in the world. He put a book out called The Mamba Mentality, and we're showing you a picture of it right now. It's on sale. It's a great book, and we are going to catch up with Andy on the next show. I can't wait. He's the best. He is the best. All right, and you know what? If you want to watch Playing the Field, like, all the time because you love us so much, you can do that 24-7 at playingthefieldtv.com. Thanks so much for joining us today and watching. I'm Maria Soreo. I'm Will Lepardis. We'll see you next time.